ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته It's an honor to be here. I want to thank uh, Sheikh uh, Qadi for inviting me. It's great to see Dr. Bazian. Here is uh, wonderful lectures. I've had opportunities to speak after him in other events, and it's always a great education to listen to his lectures. Um, and thank you all for being here today. This is uh, unique to have an event in person. You know, the last year and a half, it's all been Zoom, sitting with pajama pants and a coat and a jacket and a shirt and doing a lecture. So this is very nice to see people again. Can you hear me okay? All right, I know there's a little bit of echo. So uh, like you heard today, exactly 54 years ago today, the Israeli army received a green light from the government to go ahead and begin an assault against uh, Egypt first. This green light from the Israeli government came after many weeks when the Israeli high command, the Israeli military high command was pushing and demanding to start a war. My father was a general he was a member of the Israeli High Command at that time. In my book, in this book, in The General Sun, I actually have the actual minutes from the meetings of these generals explaining why they wanted the war. It wasn't because there was a uh, threat. It wasn't because Israel was being threatened or Jewish people were being threatened. They wanted the war because they saw an opportunity. And they began a massive assault against Egypt. And when that went very well, they decided they would take the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and the Golan Heights, which were areas they wanted to take anyway, they were planning to do anyway. This was a massive assault by Israel against its Arab neighbors because they wanted to destroy their military and because they wanted the land. And within six days, it was over. And then what they did was they perpetuated this myth, which we even hear today. People talk about that even today as though it's true, that Israel was under an existential threat that the Arab armies were ready to come and kill and destroy and on and on. And none of that was true. In their meetings, in the very meetings of the generals of the Israeli high command, which, like I said, included my father, they were talking about an opportunity to attack because the Arab armies were not prepared for war. They say this. The Arab armies were not prepared for war. That's why we need to attack right now. In fact, my father himself says in one point, the Egyptian army, which was the biggest, would need at least a year and a half or two years before it would be ready for war. So this is an opportunity. And the word opportunity comes up many times in their discussions. The word threat never comes up, except that they said we need to perpetuate the story that there's a threat as a means to pressure public opinion and pressure the government to give the green light, and that's what happened. People were scared, the government was pressured, and they got the green light, and in five days it was over. They call it the Six-Day War because there's a biblical connection that the world was created in six days. So in Jewish prayer, 
the six days comes up a lot, the six days of creation. And so they pick the six day war. But it's incredible that the lies that they perpetuated 54 years ago about an existential threat, even though those lies have been shown to be lies, not just by me, people before me and people after me and people, you know, other Israeli generals stood up and said later on it was a lie. But it sticks. And this image of these poor Israelis being threatened is something that is continuing to this day. And it was a lie then, and it's a lie today. And you know what's interesting? We saw images over the last few weeks. And by the way, I just landed. I was in Palestine. I just landed two days ago. I was there for about three weeks, two and a half weeks. And we saw images, and I'm sure you saw the images in Al-Aqsa during Ramadan. You heard about the expulsions or the attempted expulsions of Palestinians from neighborhoods around in Jerusalem, Sheikh Jarrah, Silwan, inside the old city, the Muslim quarter. You know, this, this is an ongoing process. From time to time, something reaches the headlines. Something reaches the news, and so we talk about it. But this has been going on for a long time, and it's an ongoing process. Expulsion of Palestinians from their home and expulsion of Palestinians from their land and Israeli settlers taking over, that's not news. It's been going on for 75 years. But from time to time, there's a little eruption, so we hear about it. So this was Sheikh Jarrah, and then it went through the old city and Silwan, and then of course, the Al-Aqsa compound and the mosque. And this is during Ramadan, as I'm sure you know. And um, you may have seen the images of young Israelis running through the streets calling death to Arabs. And then these big festive, you know, uh, occasions in the plaza just below Al-Aqsa where the wall is, where Al-Burak is. And they're dancing with the Israeli flag. And on top you can see the flames because as a result of the shooting by the Israeli forces, there was a fire. Not in the mosque, but next to the mosque. And as I was watching this too, I remembered after the 1967 war and all the way till today, the most iconic sentence that everybody remembers, and you to ask any, I don't know if American Jews, but certainly Israelis, the most iconic sentence that people remember is when the commander of the forces that took the old city and occupied Al-Aqsa, he said in, the, in his speaker, the Temple Mount is in our hands. The Temple Mount is, is the name for the Al-Aqsa compound, the Haram al-Sharif. Now, there were these images of the soldiers reaching and crying and getting all excited about this. Now, these were not religious people. You know, these were secular Israelis. Most Israelis are secular. This idea of Al-Aqsa actually being the Temple Mount, actually belonging to the Jews, is not a religious idea. It's a nationalistic idea. It became kind of a nationalistic Zionist symbol. And immediately after the war also, the national poet of Israel wrote a song called Jerusalem of Gold. Maybe some of you heard of it. It became also iconic. Jerusalem of Gold became iconic. And in this song, in Hebrew of course, there are several lines which represent the narrative. And these lines talk about how the water wells dried up. The marketplace is empty. No one goes up to the Temple Mount, to the Haram al-Sharif. Nobody goes. It's empty. Nobody goes there to pray. 
The old city is like a ghost town. It's empty. The old city of Jerusalem. And nobody travels the road. There's a famous road that goes from Jerusalem down towards the Dead Sea. And nobody go, takes that road anymore. In other words, there's nobody there. There's nobody there. A land without a people. A city without a people that we redeemed, that we reclaimed, and is now ours. Now, she was as secular as you could possibly imagine, because Israeli culture is secular. They use Judaism, they use Jewish symbolism to kind of push forward this secular ideology, this secular nationalist almost neo-fascist ideology. But this song became iconic. The marketplace was empty. Jerusalem was empty. Nobody went to pray on the Temple Mount. There's a huge mosque there. The most iconic symbol of Jerusalem is what? The most iconic symbol when we imagine Jerusalem is the Golden Dome. These incredible structures that have been there for some 1,500 years, longer than anything else that's ever been there, with enormous significance, religious significance, historic significance, cultural significance. This city that was a Muslim and Arab city for 1,500 years. And they talk about it like there was nothing there. The Temple Mount is in our hands again. The city was empty. Nobody was in the marketplace. This perpetuates the Zionist ideology, the Zionist narrative that Palestine was empty and that for 2,000 years, nothing happened in Palestine. The Jews were there 2,000 years ago, maybe three. They were expelled, now we're back, and that's it. We pick up from where we left off. Nothing happened. This narrative that completely ignores a 1,500-year history, the people that existed there, that continue to exist there, the Palestinian people, this is the heart and soul of the Zionist narrative. So it's not that destroying Al-Aqsa and building some kind of a structure which they call a temple, it's not just a religious idea. It's, in fact, it's not a religious idea at all. Orthodox Jews oppose this completely. It's a Zionist ideal. And what we saw, these images that we saw over the last few weeks are very troubling because secular Zionists want, that, want to see this happen. I mean, I, can, I can't imagine, you know, the horror. I had Palestinian friends who were in the mosque, in Al-Aqsa, while the Israeli forces were attacking. The shooting, the tear gas, the bullets flying. How easy is it for a fire to start? And then suddenly they say, well, sorry, it was a fire, it was an accident. I mean, this is real. And the reason I'm saying this, you know, like Dr. Bazian said, there's a, there's a sense that there's something, that there's change. But it's very, very slow. We need to stop being patient about Palestine. We need to stop being patient and waiting for somebody to do something. Each and every one of us has to be Salah al-Din, like he said, and to act. Each one of us has to talk to somebody. Each one of us has to send a letter. Each one of us has to make a phone call. Each one of us has to write a, a you know, give out flyers. Each one of us has to do this. Because after it's destroyed, it'll be too late. And the process of destroying Palestine is moving forward full force. 
The Israelis don't rest. The Zionists don't rest. They never rest. They've got huge organizations in America. They've got huge, very effective organizations in Europe. They've got organizations working in Latin America, in India, everywhere. They are pushing forward with their agenda. And it's crucially important that we all understand how important it is that each and every one of us, and I like this idea of each person seeing themselves as Salah al-Din, each and not waiting for somebody to come and save it. We have to do it. People always ask, will there be peace? Will Palestine be free? It depends on us. It's not going to come from somewhere else. It's going to come from us. Palestinians are doing everything they can in Palestine. And if you're paying attention, one, I think, of the remarkable things that we saw in this last uprising is Palestinians all over Palestine were responding. There's no more West Bank and Gaza. West Bank and Gaza are two Zionist concepts. Who created the West Bank? Before 1948, there was no such thing. What's the Gaza Strip? Where did that come from? These were constructed by the Zionists because those are particular areas that they wanted to create. These boundaries disappeared in terms of the protests. People are saying, well, Hamas were shooting rockets into Jerusalem. Why? As though Hamas is some entity, Jerusalem is another entity, Palestinians in other parts of the country are other entities, and they're not connected. It's like saying, why is somebody from Dallas joining the American, uh, the U.S. Army? They should be joining the Dallas Army or something. You know, they, they try to create this impression that there are no Palestinians. There's no Palestinian unity. There's no Palestinian entity. It's all Palestine. From the River Jordan to the, to the Mediterranean Sea, from the northern border with Lebanon to the Gulf of Aqaba, it's all Palestine. The majority of the people who live there are Palestinian Arabs. They're all controlled by what we know today officially is an apartheid regime called Israel. But it's Palestine, and the majority of the population are Palestinians, who of course have been designated different status. I won't get into that. But what we saw over the last few weeks is this unity. Palestinian flags were everywhere. Everywhere, in every city, in every town. West Bank, not West Bank, Gaza, no Gaza, the Naqab, al Jalil, all of parts of Palestine, Jerusalem, of course. And that's precisely what we need to encourage. That's precisely what we need to make sure we support. Now, you probably heard Israel had elections again, and after a fourth time in a couple of years, and the news and the commentary, who won, who lost, is Netanyahu this, is Netanyahu that. Who cares? Who cares? There's a train that's about to hit the wall. Doesn't matter who's, uh, who, who's, who's driving the train. They're all lunatics. They're all violent, racist lunatics. We should be worried about the people in the train. We should be worried about Palestine, about the Palestinian people who are suffering the consequences. We should be talking about how we free Palestine. We should be talking about how we get thousands of Palestinians out of Israeli jails. The main jail being the Gaza Strip with over two million people. I was in Jerusalem while Gaza was being bombed. To drive from Jerusalem to Gaza is maybe an hour. It takes maybe an hour. It's less than 100 miles. I could have been there in 45, 50 minutes by car. It's that close. Gaza was being bombed. I was getting messages from friends who live in Gaza. People with children 
who saw their friends being bombed, their neighbors being killed. And I'm less than an hour away, and everything's fine. People are going to work, people are sitting in coffee shops, there's electricity, everything is fine. The segregation that Israel established in Palestine is so, so effective that you could be less than 100 miles from this hell that was going on in Gaza and feel nothing. You could be less than that. You could be 10 miles away. As long as you're in an Israeli city, in an Israeli settlement, and everything's fine. You can see the smoke, and some people do, and they look at the smoke, and they see the planes dropping the bombs, but they go on, sipping their coffee, kids go to school, everything's normal. They create this impression as though Israelis are under attack. Israelis are defending themselves. Defending themselves against what? Two million people? More than half of them are refugees? Homeless? Bombed? With no access to water? No access to medical care? Defend themselves against what exactly? What is this nonsense? But they found out this formula that works. Because, for example, the Gaza Strip is a humanitarian catastrophe. Two million people living in an, a concentration camp. You gotta do something. Now, the obvious solution would be to open the gates, allow people to return to their homes. These people's homes are not in the Gaza Strip. Their homes, their land, their water, their rights or in other places, other parts of Palestine. They all came from somewhere. And by the way, if you ask the youngest kids in Gaza, they'll tell you exactly which village they came from. So that would be the obvious thing. Let them go home. Pay them reparations, compensate them, rebuild Gaza, rebuild these, these communities. These are people who are highly educated who want to go to work and want to be productive. We're not talking about millions of uneducated people. We're talking about a highly educated community who can contribute, who wants to contribute, who want to build. But Israel doesn't want that. God forbid, they don't want the Palestinians back. Now, you can't just sit there and do nothing. So they came out with this demonic, satanic formula. Kill them and blame them for it. Kill them and say it's their fault because they're terrorists. And as absurd as this sounds, as crazy as this sounds, the rest of the world just nods their head and says, yes, yes, that makes sense. They're terrorists, so Israel has a right to kill them. There's never been a tank in Gaza. There's never been a military force. There's never been an army. Palestinians have never had an army. Palestinians have never had a tank, let alone an F-16. But Israel learned that she could, this formula works. They slaughter innocent civilians and blame them for being terrorists. And then when they shoot rockets, they say, aha, see, they're terrorists. Who is, so Israel has a right to defend itself, but Palestinians don't. Israel has a right to bomb and slaughter innocent civilians, but Palestinians have no right to fight back. Because when they fight back, that's terrorism. This is an incredibly insane formula. And those of us that know that this is insane need to speak up. We really need to speak up. We need to tell people, this is insane. Are you listening to this? And this brings us to another issue, again, which uh, Dr. Bazian uh, brought up, this issue of, well, if you criticize Israel, then you're anti-Semitic. Nobody wants to be anti-Semitic. Nobody wants to be a racist. <clears throat> Zionism is a racist ideology. The state of Israel is founded on a racist ideology. Israel is an apartheid, racist, violent regime that has taken over Palestine. That is how we need to talk about it. Anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, Zionism, white supremacy, these are all forms of racism. 
Opposing them is the right thing to do, all of them. Most Orthodox Jewish people oppose Zionism. They always have. Zionism has got nothing to do with Judaism. They stole this identity and they use it like we heard just now from uh, Dr. Bazian. They used it. It has nothing to do with being Jewish. It has nothing to do with liking or disliking Jews. Yes, Israel is a, Jewish, is, is a state where Jewish people live. But the regime is a racist, apartheid regime. It is violent. It is oppressive. It's engaged in the... By the way, apartheid is a well-defined crime, as is genocide, as is a, ethnic cleansing. And the state of Israel is engaged in all three crimes. And people say, well, don't say genocide because the crime of genocide has a clause that says you have to show intent in order for it to be genocide. So you have to find some place where the Zionists actually wrote down that they intend to destroy the, the, the Palestinian people. Well, they didn't write it down. But you know what? We have a 75-year history. You know, you drop a bomb, you kill innocent civilians once, okay, that's an accident. You do it twice, maybe it's an accident. You do it for 75 years on a systemic, regular basis, it's genocide. And that's what we see there. That's why I think it's important to use these terms because they are well-defined crimes. So opposing Zionism is the right thing to do, just like opposing any other form of racism. Opposing Zionism and opposing anti-Semitism and opposing Islamophobia is all the right thing to do. Because these are all racist ideas and racism, of course, should have, we should have no tolerance for racism. I think it's crucial. So where do we go from here? What do we do? I mean, that's always the question. And it's hard to speak up. There's no question that it's hard because the media and public opinion are all going in the other direction. But that's okay. That's okay. Palestinians have a right to live. Palestine has a right to be free as a country, as a culture, as a people. And it's not going to happen unless we act. People of conscience, people who understand, need to act. That's how things change. That's how we do things. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to get up in the morning and act and do the thing that we do best, whether it's on social media, whether it's with our friends, whether it's a book club, whether it's writing to your congressman. You know, it's absurd. American politicians think that they can say that they're Zionists and it's okay. There's a president, President Biden said he was a Zionist and he's proud of it. Is he out of his mind? I didn't learn about Zionism in a college course. I didn't learn about Zionism from a book. My grandfather signed the Israeli Declaration of Independence. I grew up in Zionism. I know what Zionism is. And I reject it completely. You have to reject Zionism if you have a conscience. To be proud of being a Zionist? What else is he proud of? Being a pedophile? I mean, what is next? It's that severe. We need to make sure that our elected officials know that there should be no tolerance for Zionism, just like there should be no tolerance for other forms of racism. But we need to make it clear to them that being Zionist is a crime, is supporting racism and violence. We need to make it clear to them. Unless they support the call to boycott, the call to impose sanctions, the call to isolate Israel, then they're not going to be elected. Not only to support it, they need to push for it. They need to demand sanctions against Israel. There needs to be a no-fly zone over Gaza. The Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean should be there supporting the Palestinians, giving them relief. 
making sure that Israel can't bomb anymore. There should be no more weapons sent to Israel. What is this? Why are we supplying Israel with money and weapons? Can anybody explain that? Other than to help the weapons manufacturers? So we need to make sure our politicians know what we think about these things. And that we demand of them to take a strong stance, to take a clear stance, so that there is a change. And I am optimistic. I do believe that a free Palestine, that Israelis and Palestinians can live in peace, but not, in a racist, not under a racist regime, not in an apartheid regime where I have all the privileges. And Dr. Bazian can't even visit Palestine let alone go to Nablus and live there if he chooses to. I can go back tomorrow and live there if I choose to. That is unacceptable. The apartheid is unacceptable. The privilege is unacceptable. The privilege has to be given to everyone. There's plenty to go around. So that needs to be the, it, that needs to be the goal. A free, democratic, one person, one vote, liberated Palestine, decolonized, with the right of the refugees to return, actually materializing. All Palestinian ref uh, refugees allowed to return, prisoners released. None of that's going to happen unless the Zionist regime falls. Israel will never allow any of that to happen. There's no one part of Palestine that can be fixed. It has to be a whole thing or nothing at all. Now, I'd be remiss if I was here in Dallas and didn't mention our friends from the Holy Land Foundation, five. Five Palestinian Muslim Americans, five heroes, five incredible human beings, four of which are still in jail. So I wrote this book a couple of years ago about the Holy Land Foundation, five. Um, if you don't know the story, the story is in here. If anybody has any doubt whatsoever that these men are innocent, they're not only innocent, they're saints. They're heroes. And as you may know, two of them were in for 15 years, which are just over. Abdurrahman Aude and... Uh, Muhammad al Mizain and Abdul Rahman, thank God, is released. Mufid Abdul Qadir has five more years. And Shukri Abu Bakr and Ghassan al Ashi got 65 years. For what? For being Muslims, for being Palestinians, for being good people. That's it. If they were anything else, they would be free men. So we need to remember them, and I believe we should be doing everything we can to release them. And they are political prisoners, by the way, just like the political prisoners in Palestine. There's no difference. They will be released when they will be released. It's a political issue. They're political prisoners. And this is the reach of the Zionist organizations that they can, they can impact a trial here in the United States, here in Dallas, and put five good men in jail on terrorism charges, men that wouldn't hurt a fly, the finest, kindest men you'll ever meet. So it's impacting everyday life, everyday people here in America too. So again, being here in Dallas, I thought it would be important to remind us ourselves and to take a moment to think about these five great men and how we help them and how we get their release. And you know, a, oops, uh, a word of optimism. Um, I'm sure you've heard of South Africa and that South Africa used to be an apartheid regime. And in 1994, Nelson Mandela became the president of South Africa. He was released from prison after 28 years and he became the president of South Africa in 1994. 
If we sat here today and it was 1988 or 1989, and somebody stood up and said, in 1994, Nelson Mandela would be president of a free South Africa. Everybody else would laugh. Everybody would laugh. In 1989, nobody would have believed that within five years, South Africa will be free of, from apartheid, and Nelson Mandela would not just be free, but president of South Africa. Nobody would have believed it. And I always remind myself of that story when I'm depressed. When things look terrible, when things look hopeless, I always remind myself of that. Things can move very quickly. They can move very quickly. And a free, democratic Palestine can, will, and must be a reality. I believe it depends on us. So please, remember Palestine. Do everything you can for Palestine. Think of Al-Aqsa and remember how valuable and how important it is to protect Palestine, to protect Al-Aqsa, and to protect the people of Palestine. Thank you all very much.